is how do we become better human beings so we can become Imam Mahdi's helpers? And brother recited an ayat of Quran. I don't know if anybody caught it. What was the first ayat he recited? Anybody remembers? I'll read it for you, but it's quite important. This ayat, the Prophet has said that if you emulate it, you become a perfect man, a perfect human being, perfect as a Muslim, if you follow this ayat. I'm just going to give you a part of it. Allah says in Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 177, Bismillah ar birra Allah says, it is, it is not righteousness that you turn your faces to the east and west. That's not righteousness. Some people consider like when they do salah, they you know, you know, face each direction, or some of us turn to the east in terms of qibla, or some of us turn to the west for our, you know risk and money, and that's where the material world is. That's not what righteousness is, Allah is saying. It's more than that. Allah says, وَلَكِنَّ بِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ That's the first part of this ayat. What is one of the first things we need to do to become perfect as human beings? Excellent as human beings that we can be the Imam's helpers? Is that you need to believe in Allah. That concept, we forgot in our lives. We believe, well, okay, there's a heat game tonight. All right, can't wait. Our lives have become... Um, materialistic. Our lives have become, we've become, you know, chained to this world, and we don't know how to come out of it. So, two parts I've taken from a couple of books. One is called The Awaited Savior by Ayatollah Bakr Sadr and Ayatollah Mutahari. I've taken some of the points from them, and then Mutahari has done another book called The Perfect Man. So I've taken some pieces from that, and we put together the main points to give us an idea how we can be the Imam's helpers. The first thing you'll notice in uh, the book of the Awaited Savior is it talks about history. And we're living in a time that we are making history today. It's amazing what's happening to the world. You look at what's happening in the Middle East, you look what's happening in the West, you look what's happening even here in Canada. The laws have just changed so much from 50 years ago, from 100 years ago. If you had the laws of today, hundred years ago, men marry men today in Canada. It's legal. A hundred years ago, it would be crazy. People go crazy. Or what's happening in terms of destruction in the Middle East where they're just killing people and no one cares. No one cares anymore. It's about money, power, oil. We know it. Who cares about everybody? So this, what we're living in is such an amazing time in history. And we, as human beings, are making history. You as a person who, who is here today trying to emulate and say the Fatima or the Imam Ali or the Prophet and try to become you know a powerful perfect kind human being so that you can make a difference on this earth it's, it's fantastic so history if you look at it it's always been constant change go back 50 years ago what is happening the old gets dies out and the new comes in and there's a revolution that's happening look what's happening with technology today Ask your parents, um, the, you know, I don't know about you guys, but some of our parents, they don't know how to use computers, or they don't know how to use Facebook, or they don't know how to use Twitter, or they don't even know how to search something. Unfortunately, they're dying away. And the way the world is changing, how the process of history is changing, it's, it's between good and evil, it's between, um, I guess, backwardation to forward progressive thinking. So some people say, well, my parents are not that backward. They're very forward thinking. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a change that's causing the Imam to reappear soon. This is what we're waiting for. Why was he away for 1,200 years? What is he waiting for? He's looking at the world and he's seeing the progression of humanity from their old ways of thinking, especially if you watch these movies now, what's happened in history. You know, movies that are a thousand years old, it talks about the history of, I don't know, the gladiators, or there was a movie that came out and talked about history of how the world was in Europe, and how backward they were in the Dark Ages, and you see what's changed today. All this change in history, it's a struggle that humanity is going through. I'm trying to get to a point that how we as individuals can make change in history. 
We're, we're in the point that we have the chance to tip the world toward righteousness, doing good. How do we do that? How do we become the Imam's helpers in establishing the road for him to be here? How do you do it? So when you look at this world, this the development of history, the process, even the problems that you go through. Like, I'll give you an example. If you go down this road and you trip and you fall, you're going to realize, okay, this road is dangerous. Next time I won't do that again. I'm going to be careful. So even though the world goes through struggles and problems, you need this. You need those struggles and problems. It helps us progress. So now you're looking from the old to the new. Now we're coming to a stage of history where you're saying, okay, is this what's going on? What is the goal? As you as an individual, Quran, if you look at the world and you say, what is driving me is, you know, I want, I want a job, I want money, I want a house, a career. If that's your drive, what's going to happen to you? You won't succeed in the hereafter. You won't succeed in the hereafter. Well, you will succeed in feeding your family, which is important. But what will happen if everybody's drive is money, power, force? What's going to happen? You're going to see that no doubt that you will make an impact in history. And you've seen that with the kingdoms. You know, there was the Muslims of Spain. Or you can see the Americans in the last 200 years. They were the most powerful nation in this period, short period of time. <coughs> What's happening to these empires? They all crumbled. The Roman Empire crumbled. It's just a matter of time. If their goal was wealth, money, power, struggle, yes, they will, of course, make an impact in history. But in the end, the goal is almost evil. Because they'll kill anybody to get what they want. They want the power, they want the kingdom. That means the Turkish Empire, they were killing each other. Their own brothers and uncles and siblings were killing each other. They collapsed. So not only will they not succeed in the hereafter, in this life, eventually you lose. Now when is your goal as a human being in, in, uh, impactful in history that you can make something important happen? What would be your goal then? Not money, power, but what else? Any sisters? I'm talking a little deep because actually I tell Abakar Sadr here he's, little, he's getting a little complicated and Mutari gets complicated. But they're trying to get something important. They're saying if your goal is for the benefit of society, okay, now you've made an impact. Because now everybody's trying to help each other. And now as together if we all help each other and we're trying to improve the world, not only it's informative, it's educational, but it's so rewarding, now the world starts flourishing. So for example, we have the technology to, I don't know, make salt water into clean water in, in a very cheap basis. If I hoard this knowledge, what's going to happen? There are people in the world who are dying without water. I'm getting greedy, selfish, and for money. And I'll sell this technology for trillions of dollars only, otherwise forget it. Then the whole world will die away eventually. That doesn't work. Look what happens to the companies of medicine. Anybody works for any drug companies? Not the drug dealers, the drug, drug companies. <laughs> oh, you work for a drug dealer? I remember doing a case on this in business school in Burke. And Burke had this uh, one uh, drug that would clear that would um, cure a disease called liver blindness. Yes. And so there was this whole debate internally within Burke that they could produce it and lose money on it, but distribute it to save millions of lives. Or do they just... Uh, just forget it because it's not profitable. So we ran this as a case discussion in, in school, and uh, interesting to see that most of the class um, started off believing that you know, don't bother doing it because you're not going to make money. The purpose of corporations to make profits and so on. Capital. But slowly, as it moved on, and we did this over a few classes, that changed. Excellent. And what actually ended up happening is most did go ahead and, uh, and distribute that. Thing. And they found a way to make a profit. I think so. Yes. <laughs> That's interesting. So is, he said something very important. Look at the technology companies. I don't know what chip you have in your laptop. You know? Okay. okay. Do you know they have technology that's 10 years forward today? They have it. But if they give it to you today, they say, well, how are we going to make money? So let's keep doing iPod or iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4, PS 1, 2, 3. I'm not going to give you PS 100 right now. Why would I do that? And make a scare. Let PS 3 players can't play with each other. It's a scam. What's going to happen in a few months? Oh, we have a new software, pay some money every month, and now you'll be protected. You won't have this hackers coming in. 
So they, they slowly give you the improvement of technology. They slowly give you the medicine to, to eventually get you better and better. For example, if I have the cure of an ulcer, if I have the cure of HIV today, take that example, and it costs me one cent, and I can distribute it for the, to the whole world. But I'm making medicine here, $1,200 a pill. Do I really want to do that? <laughs> let it come later. Let me, let me maintain the person so that they can survive instead of curing. This is the d disease if your goal is money. If your goal is power and money, it's destructive. But if your goal is for the betterment of society, now you're entering the world what Imam wants from us. As a perfect human being who cares for others more than his own self. That I will sacrifice and spend money. We just heard today one brother bought this car. One brother built this masjid and paid it for himself with his own money. He didn't care. He didn't want any money for himself. He says, I'm doing this for God. What's happening? The society is benefiting in this community. They're coming here gaining knowledge. And for him, he's getting tremendous benefit as, a, as just in terms of his, his self. And as you can see, he's benefiting financially. He's doing well. At the same time, in the, with Allah. Allah is pleased with what his actions are because he's doing it for him. So in the hereafter, as you were saying. So you're getting both. But now, if our goal is, is just for this world, you see destructive possibilities. Children in Africa are dying with AIDS and all these problems. And maybe there are some important cures out there, but they're suppressing them. And that's because of money and power and selfish. And brother, I know you were trying to raise money for the people of HIV in Kenya, which is fantastic. And we need to help each other. But if we don't, what's going to happen? The world will die away. So now it's time for what Imam Mehdi has been promised for. There's an ayat of Quran that says the oppressed, the weak, the suffering will be given the world. It will be given the Imam. Allah says, Allah promises those of us who are oppressed, weakened, suffering, People dying without food, dying without water, because there's a few who just want to grab the wealth of the world and oppress the world, and they just they don't care for the society. Eventually, the promise of Allah is there, that the weak will inherit the earth. They will be given the power. They will be given the leadership of this earth. But can you give it to someone who's uneducated? Can I take a bum off the street and says, you've been oppressed, you've been thrown in jail, the army, and whatever, and you have no school, no job, no life. Okay, you're the president of Canada, prime minister of Canada. He can't handle it. So what do we need to do to get that role? Because we're bums too in, in our own ways. Okay, we're, we're not progressing. How do we change? We've gained the knowledge of history of how good against evil has been there. There's been a struggle of between right and wrong. There's been a struggle between progression and those who are low and perverted, you know, the, the evil world. Yes? Someone raise their hand? Okay. So how do we move in that direction? First, we need to educate ourselves. That's why we're here. We're here to gain knowledge from these scholars, from the books, put it together and, and drive us, inspire us, that we can move the next step. And Allah has promised those who struggle in his way and build the roads and the bridges for the Imam when he appears, you will be the successful ones. You will inherit this earth. Because what's your goal now? If your goal is money, you'll never get that job. If your goal is for the betterment of society, then you will be those special people <coughs> who will be leading the struggle and the fight to help the world. I know you're raising money for children in Haiti or in Africa. or in, That's the beginning. But we need to improve ourselves too. It's not just acting without being competent. We have to be competent. And we need to be sincere. Allah also promises, even in the Zabur. Yes? So that's the beginning that comes next. Okay, good, good questions. What do we need to do next? The ayat I told you in the beginning gave us a lot of points. Let me tell you what Allah says in that ayat. I'm, gonna, I'm jumping here, but I'll come back. Allah says, it is not righteousness that you face your toward east and west, but righteousness is that you should believe in Allah. One, the last day, the angels, the books of the, of the prophets, the books and the prophets, and give away wealth out of love for Him. 
You give away wealth for the love of Allah. And to the near of kin, you help your own family first, brothers and sisters. You want to help people in China, but you're not even helping your own father, you know, shovel the snow. I'm shocked. There's one sister, the mother came to us and says, I don't know why, but my daughter yells at me and yells at me and yells at me. I don't know what to do. Can you talk to her? That's sad, brothers. Sisters, what's going on? The mother who's brought you to this earth, the suffering and the pains and struggles that she's gone through, that she's crying to someone who's like, and nobody says, can you help my child wake up? I do everything for my child, and they yell at me, and they, they, they even curse at me, and they have no respect for me. Take care of your family first. And the wayfarer, and the beggars, and for those who are captives, you emancipate them, help them get freedom. And you keep up prayer. This is so important. Pray. You give the poor rate. You perform your promises when you make a promise. Some people say, brother, I can't do that. But you know what happened the other day? Two brothers and two family members said, we'll meet each other at this time at this place. But one person was there waiting and waiting and waiting. The other person was 45 minutes late. Yesterday, one brother says, I'm going to be at this much at 5 o'clock. He gets here at midnight. What happened to promises? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not pointing fingers. We need to think about something. <laughs> but the way they made him come is we have food. They finally came. Anyway. <laughs> what happened? He shouldn't have promised. He shouldn't have said, okay, 5.30, I'm there. Just down the block. No. Say, look, I'm going to play a uh, game of basketball. I'm going to do my prayers. I'm going to have dinner. And then I'll show up. Give them, give them, I know you don't want them to feel bad. But you tell them the truth. You cannot break your promises. When you say, I'm going to be there, you be there. You know, one day, this happened to Prophet Ismail and to Prophet Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. One day, Prophet Ismail tells somebody that we will meet each other at this place. The man forgot completely. Prophet Ismail kept his promise and waited and waited and waited. The town started going nuts. Where's the Prophet? They, were, they got scared. Everybody went searching. Finally, they found him, you know, where he was. And he says, what are you doing here? He says, I made a promise that I will meet this brother here at this time. And I'm here waiting. This is how much of a person of, who kept his promise, Prophet Ismail. Was. Prophet Muhammad was the same way. Allah, so Allah, Allah. Allah. He had told someone that he would meet someone, you know, where he was grazing his sheep. This is when he was younger. And he kept his promise and the person never showed up. Finally, they, the guy showed up and he fulfilled his promise. Look at that level, that they wait and with patience. So the guys who came to the mosque at 5 o'clock and finally the guy came at 12.30, the kindness and patience they had, I don't know, that's, that's a good friend, I tell you. I would have been gone at 5 or 5 as they were fine. <laughs> so keep your promises. Patience in distress and affliction in a time of conflict. We have no patience. Look at this child who yells at his, his mother. She has no patience. He just screams and just blows up and has all these problems. We need to have patience. And when we, those who are true to themselves, <laughs> and these people who are true to themselves, and those who are really good like this, they will have taqwa and they will be successful and then they will be righteous. So we have to do a lot of things. But before we get there, we need to think about how do we perfect ourselves now? All right, I gave you the, the map of the world, all these conflicts that have happened in history. And you can't say that this one person was, the world was all about this one person. The world was about a community, about society. The world was about the ancient Egyptians. And that's where the world was about. The, the world was about the Renaissance movement in Europe. It wasn't about one guy. It was about the whole community and how it took shape. The world was about the Americans. You know, some people say it's about Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or... Whoever, or Harper over here, no, it's about a society, the way they behaved, it influenced the whole history of that period of time. Someone have a question? So, I guess you guys are stretching, because I keep seeing hands go up, <laughs> getting bored over there. So, all this that's happened in life, Allah's promised, even in the Zabur, Zabur is the Psalms of Prophet Dawood, of David, and Allah says in Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي زَبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ 
أن الأرض يرثها إباد الصالحون. Even in this, Allah says, verily we have written in this, the, the, the books of the Torah, after the, after the Torah, the, you know, the Prophet Dawood brought, the Psalms of the Prophet Dawood. And it's been revealed that my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. So Allah is saying, if you want to inherit this earth, if you want to succeed, you want to achieve righteousness, you can do it. And I promise that you will be the inheritance if you're righteous. We're coming at a time where the signs of Imam Mahdi is you're going to see extreme wickedness and extreme righteousness. Those of us who are either more closer to the wickedness or those of you who are more closer to righteousness, we still need to progress. Because we can't just be in gray matter. We need to be better. We need to achieve perfection. Like emulating the Ahlul Bayt. So Allah says in Quran, going back to what this brother is saying, what do we need to do? Allah says, Qad aflaha man zakkaha. He is indeed successful who has purified himself. Wa qad kaaba man dasaha. And he who has failed is one who corrupts himself. If I'm corrupted, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a drug dealer, and I'm selfish, and I'm greedy, and I don't give my charity, and I don't... I'm not kind to my parents, and I don't keep my promises, and I'm late, and I'm this and that. This, we're corrupting our own selves. And if we don't have the proper environment for us to change, we're in trouble. Because if we're in trouble, that means the world today, the history of the world today, is not going to progress. We're going to actually go in backwardation. We're going to go backward in life. And that's disastrous, because now Imam is waiting for us. He says, purify yourselves. Help yourselves, change, and I will be with you. And he's saying to us, I had hope in that brother Akil. And I had hope in that sister Zahra. And I had hope in you, but you gave up on me. Why? So, if you go into a fascinating uh, like story, Brother Ali Al-Qadmi was telling me a story. His friend went to uh, Karbala. And it's amazing. The story was quite... Um, in, coincidentally, the same story happened to Imam Zain al -Mazin. So his friend went to Karbala, and something strange happened. When he went to Karbala, he didn't see human beings. He saw animals. Everybody was like a dog, a pig. And he was like, he got, was, was he high on something? He said, what's going on over here? It was like strange what happened. He got scared. He said, look at this. Look what's happening to the world. Everybody's become a beast. The same story happened when Imam Zainal Abidu was, was with his companion. And the companion says, look at all these people. Some people say this was in the time of Arafah when they looked at the valley of Arafah and they said, look at all these, so many people who are worshipping God. And some people say this was around the Kaaba when they were walking around. Whatever the exact story is, Imam Sajjad says to his companion, look again. And he looks again and he sees animals and people who were just beasts. And they're selfish, and they're greedy, and they're pushing, and they're just becoming horrible. We're living in that time again, where people have become beasts. We just don't care for anybody. Someone falls on the street, you just keep walking. You know, in Switzerland, if you see someone fall on the street, you don't pick them up, you go to jail. You get a ticket. You have to help. You have to help each other. But you know what happens? People still ignore them. They drive fast. Oh, it's an old lady on the floor. Oh, let's get out of here. <laughs> but there's a law, you get a ticket if they see you pass by, you don't do something. At least that law seems to be good, but no one follows it. So, if we've become beasts like that, and we don't care for each other, then we're not going to be the Imam's help. We're not, we're not achieving perfection. So, a person's personality, his ethics, and his spiritual qualities is what makes you a person. When I say the person is a beast, what is it? Is there's no ethics. She has no ethics. They're just like a, a donkey that's, you know, like the brain of an ass, the Quran called it. Allah hates that sound. And, the, and just screaming and like rubbish comes out of your mouth. We've become like that if our ethics and our spiritual qualities are weak. Some people, they come to all these programs and they're the best debaters. You debate them about Salat, they'll blow you away. You debate them about Allah, infiniteness of Allah. Yeah, there was a nice debate the other day. Some of you saw it. Or the debate about the infallibility of the Ahlul Bayt. They're beautiful. 
But when you look at their practice as Muslims, they don't even pray. <laughs> You're a genius. What's wrong with you? Shaitan got them. Their morals, their ethics, their spiritual qualities are weak. So that they can be the most smartest, but they're acting as asfal as the, the worst of the worst. They're acting worse than beasts. At least the beast worships God. So, to know a perfect personality, you can't just look at this ayat and say, okay, the perfect personality of righteousness is okay. You believe in Allah, and you fast, and you have charity. How would you know how to behave? Can you have a road map and say, okay, I know how to be a perfect person? Everybody watches any sports? Who do you like as your favorite sports superstar, sports guy? Who do you like? Messi. Who? Messi? Messi? It's a soccer player. Okay, what team does he play? Barcelona. Barcelona. Okay, why do you like him? In what? In soccer. In soccer. What is he good at? Good. Like what? Is he a forward? Is he... Okay. So the way he plays, you try to emulate him. So, okay, this guy is, is almost perfect in the way he plays soccer. And so you want to emulate the way he kicks. You emulate the way he runs. Do you emulate the way he, you know, you know, I don't know how you move a ball from one way to another. What do you call that? Dribbling. Dribbling, just like basketball. The way he dribbles. I want to move this way to trick the guy. You emulate him. What is our perfect roadmap? The prophet. The imams. Ahlul Bayt. If you don't have that, you have nothing. You know, I feel sorry for the other schools of thought. Because they use, say, Muawiyah or Yazid as their example. We may say, like, are these people nuts? You know, some people say, radiallahu an to uh, Yazid. <coughs> Do they know what he did? Do they know that he massacred the family of the Prophet? That he used to, like, do crazy things and was horrible and a drunk and a womanizer, adult, you name it. Do you know? Do they know what he did? They said, yeah, that's what the president does today. I mean, it's not a big deal. That's the American president today, you know, or the Canadian president. This is what everybody does today. Not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Because if you're emulating them, like this guy Messi, I don't know if you've seen his life outside of soccer. I don't know him, so I don't know. I can give you an example, but... If you look at some of the basketball players, when I was young, they would love to watch Michael Jordan. And the guys who emulated him would stick their tongue out when they dribble, because Michael Jordan would stick their tongue out when they dribble. And then he had a gambling problem. So they would, hey, you gamble? I want to gamble. You know, come on. Some of our community is like brainwashed with gambling. They emulated him in everything of his life. We need to have a perfect roadmap to achieve perfection. I can tell you that we have to become perfect to become Imam Mehdi's helpers in the road of perfecting ourselves, our ethics, our morality, to help him. But if we don't know who to copy, then how would we know how to do it? We need an example, a role model in morality. That's what al Bayt was. So I feel sorry for the other schools of thought who don't know, you know who is a righteous person. And then when they look at the Bible, look at Prophet Dawood, they look at him doing haram things. That's not, a, that's not true, first of all. None of that is true. That's made up things that if somebody says, you know, I'm doing this to make him look bad. So if I do it, it's okay. The prophet did it, I did it. They so they put down the prophets. Even to today, some people put down our prophet. That he, you know, did something like frowned at people. Come on, where do you get that? If he's our perfect example, he doesn't do those things. We make up these things to make him look bad. That's not what Islam is about. So for us... We need an exemplary human being to emulate. I'm going to get to a point. Because all this I'm talking about is how we as individuals need to do something. It's going to lead to something next. So keep, keep attention at this point. So first, we need to be a good example of human perfection. Who is our best example of Islamic teachings of a human being? A role model is the Prophet, Imam Ali, Sayyidah Fatima, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. These are our examples. Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Musa, Prophet Isa, all the great prophets are examples. They're all perfect in the way they behaved in morale. Prophet Dawood is our example. Today when I look at what's happening in Gaza, I can't believe what's happening. Children are taking rocks and they're swinging it and throwing it at the Goliaths of today. 
And those poor children of righteousness, I was watching an ad. This guy is trying to sell a Subaru. And the Subaru runs over a bunch of kids and drives away. And they say, look, buy a Subaru and you'll be able to fight the kids of Gaza. Or this is actually the West Bank. I said, what is, not, what is this craziness in the world? That they don't see the oppression of children and how the children are emulating Prophet Daoud against the evil Goliaths of their time? It's the same story all over again. No one says a word. It's so ironic when you see these children throwing the rocks. It's the same story that we hear of Prophet Dawood. Anyway, so we need to emulate the prophets. We need to emulate the imams to achieve a perfect human being in Islam. The Holy Prophet himself was a perfect man in Islam. Imam Ali was a perfect man. And to become a true Muslim and to make society in an Islamic environment, we do not know how but how to do it, but we need to think about and study and understand and gain knowledge how to do it. I said, grab the bum off the street, make him the president of this country. It won't work. But the guy needs to be educated, needs to be purified, he needs to be clean, you know, intelligent. They found this man, you know, he was a, a bum and unfortunately he was homeless. And they made him a, a sports announcer or whatever. They made him, I don't know if you saw him on TV a few months ago. Immediately he fell back in the trap of his drinking and of his drugs because he got some money now. They didn't change him. How could you give him the role without helping him improve himself? They need to get rehab. We as human beings, as Muslims, need to get the rehab of becoming the examples of humanity, to be the helpers of the Imam. We need to follow what say the Fatima, who gave up everything for the love of Allah. She used to give her food away. They would knock at her door, she would give away her iftar. Instead of breaking her fast with food, she would have to drink, say, water, but give away her food to the poor. This is the, for the love of Allah she did this. She's our example. <coughs> so we need this harmonious attachment with, with people. We need to care for people. We need to love people. If we don't, then we're not like the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet and the Imams and all the great Prophets. We've become selfish for money and power and greed. See, see how it links. If we don't change and follow the the path of the Quran, the way it teaches us to be, behave, or let's look to the Prophet Ibrahim. He was to us one of the greatest prophets. You know, we love Prophet Muhammad, but who is the, the father of the prophets? Come, Prophet Ibrahim. Everybody calls him the father of all prophets. He stood alone. He had nobody against the unbelievers of Namrud. They just attacked him as a child. They threw him in the fire. They hurt him. They just, just, just what he went through, you can't imagine. To the point that he was even to the point of sacrificing his child for God. And Allah saved the child, Prophet Ismail. What a struggle he went through. And so what did Allah do for him in the Quran? Other than making him a prophet, what else did he give him? What? He made him an imam. He made him a leader of this earth. And then he prayed to Allah in the Quran, and Allah says, and when we tried Prophet Ibrahim in certain words, and he fulfilled them, he fulfilled his, his trial. What's going to happen to you? You're going to be given the greatest of trials. What's your weakness? Oh, you know, I love redheads. Okay, a redhead's going to come and bother you. Oh, I love money. A PS3. Okay, X, XYZ, whatever. You know, you're going to be bothered. It's going to get to you. You're going to be tried. Are you going to be able to sacrifice that? I don't know. When you're at that point and your desires are so strong and you're in such trouble, your intellect won't even help you. You can think about it. Okay, my brain says don't do this, but my heart says go for it. <laughs> you don't know what to do at that point. You need Allah. Prophet Ibrahim turned to God and he helped him in the hardest of trials. And then he made him an imam. And then he says, what about my, you know, my what I think, what are my offspring? And Allah says, my covenant does not include the unjust, said he. So, so what does that mean? It's not for everybody. But his son, Prophet Ismail, Prophet Isaac, were made imams as well, and leaders and prophets of this world. We are going to go through these trials. And you're going to be tested so hard that you're going to say, well, do I go for the money? Or do I go for salat? Do I go for... 
you know, my desires, or do I go and feed the food that I have to those in need? Do I skip a meal today and help someone in another house who doesn't have food? This is your trial. You know, we asked some brothers and sisters, there's this couple that came from Iraq, they have no food. Their, their son who brought them is in the hospital. And I asked around, is there anybody who can help them? They're willing to get paid for food, to cook. No one can help. I'm busy. Everybody's busy. I have my own things to do. Unfortunately, the social workers of the society will have to help. And they will have to order food and help. But we as human beings don't want to help. So you have to pay someone to help others. You know, it's, it's tough. I'm telling you, what we're going through, the trials we're going through, it's crazy. You know, when, when you look at the world, you see examples all the time. Anyone knows what the moon does to the waves? You have no clue? Yes. Tides. The tides we have in the earth, they go from in and out. It's because of the moon. The effect of the moon on the tides. This world affects us in our behavior. And it gives us one, pushes us in one direction and the other. The same thing. You start looking around and you say, amazing what's happening to me. Either I'm going to be so materialistic, or I'm just going to fall over the edge and just lose it all, and go from one extreme, or go to the other extreme. Both extremes are wrong. You need to be moderate. You need to be balanced. You need to get a job. Work, struggle, feed your family. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to help give charity. You have to balance these two. If one is outweighing the other, you need to say, wait a second. I need to be able to balance this. I need to think about this more. So let's go back to the beginning. Some people become so extreme, they start brainwashing society. And this is something you have to think about. If you go to masjids and they say, don't talk politics here, brother. Don't talk anything about society. We live in a dangerous world. I laugh. I says, you don't even know the, the religion of Islam? What did the Prophet live for? He was a statesman. He was a person of taqwa, piety. He cared for society. He loved humanity. He didn't think of himself only. It's not all about worshipping Allah in a corner. It's about living that worship in your life. So for a they say a period of 100 years. You know, just go back 75 years from now. They were teaching in the masjids just about salat and wudu. And just the, the righteous, pious. They would go into the Najibalaga and only cover, you know, the, 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 the sayings of Irfan. Or the things of piety. They completely ignored, you know, there's, I think, Kutbah number 53. Malak al-Ashtar, when Imam Ali is giving him advice how to be a social person, how to care for society, how to be a governor, how to be a leader. They completely ignored all those kutbas. They covered only the ones of righteousness. So they became extreme. So Allah is saying, don't think righteousness that you face this way and that way when you're praying. That's not righteousness. Sitting in the corner and praying all day, that's not righteousness. Righteousness is you have to think outside yourself and think of the wayfarer, the captive, the hungry, you have, have to help humanity. The, the kutbahs of Imam Ali is so beautiful that he's teaching us how to live. So there was a period of time, maybe over 100 years, the whole world stayed quiet. And they didn't say anything about the oppression that was happening. But 1979, that changed. Because the people in Iran, we knew they rose and they said, we're tired of all this already. The revolution happened. The oppressive governments of the time, they said, it's your time is up. Get out. And they, they went running, actually, very far. Actually, even went to Panama. Eventually, you know, wherever they ended up. So they ran, and no one, no one in the world wanted these people anymore. It's happening again. Where is, you know, Mubarak going? Well, he's sick in the hospital, and his children are in the jail, or wherever. All that's happened is because the people of the world said, we can't take this anymore. They gained knowledge. They says, wait, I've, I've had enough of this... Worshipping in the mosque, I love Allah, but Allah's taught us in Quran that we need to establish justice. And now when you think outside of yourself, this is, well, I, I live with justice, you know, kindness in my home. It's more than that. I live like that as a human being. It's more than that. You need to let it out. Feed the world. Help the world. So what happened was, 
these political injunctions of Imam Ali to Malik al people began to learn it. And they learned how to become leaders. And then the family of the Prophet, the family of Imam Ali, the whole life of every one of them would begin to get to the way that we should emulate them. So what happens? When you see Imam Ali, what do you know of him? He would worship Allah all night, crying to Allah at night. In the daytime, what would he do? He would hang out with his friends. And he would laugh with them. One day this Amr ibn As is asking, why are you laughing? Why are you, you know, joking with your friends? That's not Islam. He says, you don't know Islam. At night, I'm worshiping Allah. I'm crying to Allah. In the daytime, I'm, I'm happy. I'm thankful. I need to be a positive impact. You know, you meet some people, it's shocking. They say, brother, um, can I come with you to, uh, you going to Michigan? Can I come with you? I said, well, the car is full. I can fit eight and have eight. Oh, oh man. Is that akhlaq? <laughs> they have such a negative personality that they make you feel bad. Okay, yeah, I can put you on the roof, but then you cross the border, they're going to get angry, right? What their akhlaq is, oh, don't worry, brother. It's okay. You know, I'm glad you're going. Go and take those brothers. Instead, they say, you know, can't you tell that guy to come next time? I'll join selfishness. You know, it's amazing how we are. We want things and we want others to suffer. We want to progress. You know what? I'm doing good in school. I'm not going to help anybody. Forget that. I want to be, I want to be the best in class. Well, your poor friend over down the block is like suffering like crazy. He doesn't know what to do. So now what's the next step? Once this person has achieved perfection, what does he need to do now? Yes. Fantastic. This is what Islam is about. You know the ayat from Surah Hujurat we've covered like a million times. Innamal mu'minun ikhwa fa'aslu bayna akhawaykum wa taqallah lalakum turham. Remember that ayat we've covered a billion times? Now you're beginning to see what it means. Who plays soccer here? Can you ever win a game by yourself? 11 on 11? No. Play basketball. Look at the, look at the Lakers. Ah, they have Kobe. They'll win. They lost four straight. You cannot do it by yourself. The Battle of Badr, 313, the Prophet had. Could he have won the whole thing? Could the Prophet have won this victory on this earth of establishing Islam and kindness and care by himself? No, you, you needed each other. Fraternity, brotherhood. This is what Islam is about. Look, when this brother is who, even though his friend was seven hours late, they hugged him and they fed him and they you know, joke with him. That's what Islam is about. You forgive each other. Yeah, he's stupid, but it's okay. <laughs> no problem. This is what is Islam about. You don't have this anger and hatred. Oh, I don't like these guys from Richmond Hill. They're always late, you know. Forget about that. Forget about the, the negatives. Think of the positive. Now you've achieved brotherhood. You know when we covered a few weeks ago that the program they had, this Indian guy... He covered this something called quantum analysis. I think I told you about it. He said, what is humanity? Is It's one. If you take the quantum physics theory of humanity, we're all one. What is brotherhood? We're all one. When you care for each other, when you love each other, the world progresses. So when you've achieved perfection, he says he likes Messi. If he doesn't have a good goalie, you think they're going to win? Yesterday we were playing basketball. Brother Ali and Brother Abbas was against me and this other guy. We lost. It's okay. But what was good about the other two? One guy was good at you know, outside. And one was good at post. When they had the two together, no one could beat them. When you take a powerful team and you put them together, no matter how good everybody's skills are, if they work together as a team, no one can beat them. Imam Mahdi is waiting for that team of society, of us. He's saying, Karar, Akil, Muhammad, Fatima, Zahra, you know, all of us work together now. Pass this guy the ball and he'll score for you. Hit the ball at me and I'll block it for you. Now you're working as a team. You know where the word, the acronym for team is? T-E-A-M? Together, everybody achieves more. Now you're working like, all right. If you think that you could do it by yourself, look at Michael Jordan again. Do you remember when he was at the, the Bulls? I don't know if you guys remember. This is a long time ago. He left and joined the Washington whatever. And he thought he was so good that he joined the team and he thought he could win. They didn't win anything. 
He never made he got a ring, never made the finals. He was good. Not to say he's not, he was good, but you couldn't do it alone. No matter how good you are in terms of your perfection, you pray all night, you fast all day, you help the world, and you come be, you could become another Nelson Mandela or you know, we said Mother Teresa. You can't do it alone. You need help. You think Mother Teresa could do anything by herself? No way. She got help. People grabbed on to help each other and they fed. There were people who donated. Look what happened in South Africa. They rose together. Look what happened in Karbala. Imam Hassan was alone. He could not have a revolution against Muawiya, the evil regime of Muawiya. He couldn't. His own cousins went against him for money, for power. And they hit him and they eventually killed him, poisoned him. Imam was saying he could have a revolution because at least he had some friends. 72 companions. That's all he had. But what he did shook this world till today. 1,400 years later, we're still mourning his death. We're still inspired by what he's done. And the revolutions today of Tunisia, of North Africa, of whatever the world you see revolution, Czechoslovakia now, they're getting crazy. It's, ah, the government's oppressive. All this is because of one man and a few companions stood up and said, we're not going to take it anymore. And we're not going to allow oppression to come into humanity. And so if that means you come and chop me up in pieces, come and, oh, swords, come and get me. Now you're thinking more outside the box. Imam Jafar Sadiq has said, a Muslim brother or sister of another Muslim brother or sister, his eyes, he is the eyes for him. And he's like a mirror to the point out all the good and bad. You, you see, when you see your brother and sister, you say, okay, he has this flaw, that means I have that flaw. I need to help him get improved. If he's doing something wrong, I need to help. When I'm doing something, he needs to help. We need to help each other. And you're a guide for each other. Never does he betray each other. Nor does he do any injustice to him. Nor does he deceive him. Nor does he tell any lies or backbites. He tries to always help each other. That's what a brother and sister is. We need to think outside of the light. Because right now we say, oh, we're in lightness. Everything's great. You never know how it is until you're on the other side. We take each other for granted. You know, you have the brothers, you know, there's one brother here who wants to play soccer in the summer. He can't afford it. Another bunch of brothers, they say, you know what, let's raise 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks each, and let them go. Some of you say, I can't come go to the camp because I can't afford it. Another bunch of good brothers, say, okay, let's sell chocolates and candy, let's help the brothers who can't come. Come. This is an example of the road, of the path to helping my men. This is exactly what it is. You hold on to each other, and you move to the rope of God. Hold on to the rope of Allah together and don't be divided. The Prophet has also said, this is the way of success. Thus, treat each other. When one comes to you, treat them with grace and love. Convey to your Muslim brother or sister whatever is incumbent on a brother or sister. When you have your own brother and sister, the way you love each other, you should love your friends. You know, the fraternity of the brotherhood in Islam no one on earth has that. No one. Find it in any religion, in any no, not even the army. The US Army, the Kenyan, they they yeah, he's my brother, you know, we're in the same, I don't know, platoon together, whatever you call it. But the way you are, but they, they, they curse at each other, they hurt each other, they backbite each other, they have no morals. Take Islam now in the truth of what submission of God really means. Is that you love Allah so much that you do everything for Allah, that now when you see His creation, you say, how could I deny them their rights? How could I not help them? How could I not love them? We covered this seven months ago when one brother had a friend, and his friend didn't have food to feed his family. So what he did was, he asked his friend for money. And his friend gave him all the money. And he took the money and gave it to his friend. So now his friend has money and food. Then what happened... The poor family with no food or no, no money, now they have money. Their friend asked for money. He says, well, okay, here, you take our money. So they have no money or food. The other guy has no money or food. And the other guy has no money or food. And money just kept going from one house to another until each one of them says, What's, wait a second, I thought I just gave you money. Yeah, you did. But you know, my other friend needed the money. <laughs> I asked the money from him. He gave me the money. Where did he get it from? Well, he borrowed it. So they realize that they love each other so much, they're willing to sacrifice their own food to help each other. 
That's fraternity. That's brotherhood. When you start thinking like that, now you're building a team. The most powerful, you know, they all love this Real Madrid. They put all these great superstars in there. Did they ever win anything, brother? Did they ever win no. anything? Where is he? He disappeared. Did the Real Madrid ever win anything? Yeah, they won. Did they win the Spanish group? No. Well, what I'm trying to say is, no matter how many excellent individuals you have, if they don't work as a team, no way. Look at all the great basketball players, all the great teams, all the great armies of the world. When they, they abandon each other, no way. You ever read the movie, the book about Braveheart? The guy was alone in the end because his own teams abandoned him. There's no way he could have won that revolution. You needed people. You need each other. Don't become hypocrites that we backstab each other. If we don't do that, we will succeed in this road to help Imam Mahdi. And let me tell you about the future now. Before Imam comes, there's going to be bloody wars. We heard about it. There's going to be struggles. Why? Because of this disunity. If we, with humanity, don't care for each other, we're going to end up fighting each other. The greed and the selfishness and the stinginess that we've had, if we, our monies are dry, we're going to just kill each other. And they say the world population will shrink by a third, two thirds, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But it's going to be bad. And so we need to stop that before it happens and to care for each other. And it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Sikh, we all help each other as brothers of humanity. We don't care if you're Shia, Sunni, you don't care if you're Druze, you don't care if you're you know, Ismaili or whatever. Look, brothers, we're all humanity first. Help each other. So there is going to be something that when the promised day comes, when the Imam appears, there's going to be a great voice in the sky. And today, as we talked about it, that could be easy. Cell phones, TVs, waves in the sky. The voice will say, oh, people of the world. The era of rule of tyrants has ended. That's it. There's going to be a time that says, okay, that's it. The oppression, the injustice, no more anymore. That's it. And the government of divine justice has begun. And the Mahdi has come. Inshallah, we pray that it comes soon. Because if we can grasp these points of how to begin to perfect each other. Perfect each other. Not ourselves, each other. And become brothers of pious, taqwa. We will be those 313, or at least the first one million of the helpers of the Imam in establishing a world of justice and peace, inshallah. Salawat. Allah. 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 Allah.